several shows ago, I told the story of the big company De Beers, the diamond company, and how they became an effective worldwide monopoly in the diamond trade and how they they manipulated the market and they had such effective marketing that they vastly changed the way Western civilization feels about diamonds, how, how we feel compelled to buy them as engagement rings now in a way that it just wasn't the same before. And it's hard to imagine a world before the necessity of you know, a diamond engagement ring costing three months salary and so on. But that was all De Beers that did that. And I, I told the story to make the argument that what we as individuals think, the opinions we hold, are not necessarily ours in the truest sense of the word. You know, they don't necessarily come from within us. They very often come from either marketing or the established culture or heredity and tradition, you know, through our parents or through, you know, whatever, that we essentially have very few opinions that come truly from within us. And so I was trying to argue that we should question our own feelings about things and and try to come to opinions that are more, you know, from deeply within us than from without. So now I'm going to, so just keep that in your mind. Now I'm going to read you a passage from a book and just imagine my surprise when, when I came across this. Now, of course, of course, the book I'm referring to is A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain, because what other book would come most in handy uh, for a story like this? What I'm going to read is, it's coming through the mouth of the main character of the book, the narrator of the book, but it's such an aside, it's so it's so disconnected from the story, it's really just Mark Twain talking through his character. So this is what he has to say. Training. Training is everything. Training is all there is to a person. We speak of nature. It is folly. There is no such thing as nature. What we call by that misleading name is merely heredity and training. We have no thoughts of our own, no opinions of our own. They are transmitted to us, trained into us. All that is original in us, and therefore fairly creditable or discreditable to us, can be covered up and hidden by the point of a cambric needle. All the rest being atoms contributed by and inherited from a procession of ancestors that stretches back a billion years to the atom, clam or grasshopper or monkey from whom our race has been so tediously and ostentatiously and unprofitably developed. And as for me, all that I think about in this plotting, sad pilgrimage, this pathetic drift between the eternities, is to look out and humbly live a pure and high and blameless life and save that one microscopic atom in me that is truly me, the rest may land in Sheol and welcome for all I care. So there you go, a little dark perhaps, but it was certainly nice to have the old master Mark Twain uh, really just totally backing me up on on that idea. And I do, I mean, there's no way to verify, but I do promise that I actually recorded that show, you know, a few weeks ago before I read this passage in the book rather than the other way around, which brings me back, of course, to libertarianism. Speaking of human nature, you know, the, the argument I make against human nature in the broadest sense is that it, although it claims to be in line with human nature, to just let people do what they want to do, and everyone's selfish, let everyone be selfish, and that'll work out better, is it it, it pretends that humans are robots, that they, you know, always follow their own best interests, they always do what's best for them, they always, you know, do their research, and, you know, figure out what they should do, and so on, and none of it really ends up working out in the end. But what happened to me a few weeks ago is I went to a Super Bowl party, and for any Australian libertarians out there, the Super Bowl is really big and exciting in the United States because it's the biggest film festival that the ad agencies put on each year. And so everyone like gets together and throws parties to watch all the, uh, the fancy um, advertisements. So I went to the Super Bowl party and you know, I met a bunch of you know, friends of friends, people I'd never met before. And of all people, I ran into an Australian libertarian. And I got to tell you, it was one of the most interesting and pleasant uh, political conversations I've had in a long time. We talked for at least two hours straight. I don't know. I didn't watch a moment of any of the ads, uh, much less the game that was on. It was, I mean, it was really, it it was interesting, (laughs) but the most interesting thing that was said was that he revealed, not he didn't just come right out and say it, but he revealed that he doesn't believe in inalienable human rights. And the way he did this was he said that 
you know, not that he would ever agree that this is a good idea, but he said that in a society that the majority should always rule, 50% plus one should rule, and the minority effectively should be oppressed by the decisions of the majority. There should be no, you know, safety net for the mi minority to prevent them from being uh, oppressed by the majority. And, and he went as far as to say that he's like, look, I, w I abhor slavery, but if I was in a society in which 50% plus one of the s people in the society voted to institute slavery, then he would say, okay, well, that then yes, we should go along with it. Like, we're in a society. We voted. That means that there's slavery. And so whether he realized it or not, what he was saying is he doesn't believe in inalienable human rights. He believes that, you know, people's rights own, are, are derived from their peers, basically, you know, in society. Libertarians, they love their principles. So he went so far as to try to reinforce his idea of the of these principles as to say, look, if I was being judged and, you know, but 10 people or whatever, and six of them thought that I should be put to death, well, then I, I would go right along with it. I would be, you know, hey, we're in a society. The people have voted. They say I should be put to death. And he, he referenced uh, the death of Socrates. He's like, oh, I love that story. Man, death of Socrates. Man, I, if, if I was voted to be put to death, I'd drink that poison lickety split. So again, like principles above people to the extent of, you know, his own life even. And so he, the idea of inalienable rights are so, uh, funny enough, alien to him that he would actually sacrifice his own life based on those principles. And so, and when I, I was hearing this, it like took me some, you know, some, some minutes to process. But once I did, I realized I was like, Oh wait, do you guys not have a bill of rights in Australia? Like, is that why you think this? Do you like, you don't realize that there should be protections for, for minorities. So I, I sort of like thought this for a little while, but then a few minutes ago, before I started uh, talking to you now, I actually looked it up. So I just, I went to Wikipedia, I found the Bill of Rights, not the American Bill of Rights, but just bills of rights in general, the idea that there's a list of the most important rights of the citizens of a country. And here's, here's what the second paragraph says on, uh, on Wikipedia. It says, Australia is the only Western democratic country with neither a constitutional nor legislative Bill of Rights, although there is ongoing debate in many Australian states. Former Australian Prime Minister John Howard has argued against a Bill of Rights for Australia as transferring power from elected politicians to unelected judges and bureaucrats. Victoria and the Australian Capital Territory are the only states and territories to have human rights bills. So, can you imagine that? I can't, uh, like, the, the, the fact that I live in Western society and have never in my life come across anyone who doesn't believe in the idea of human rights and that you shouldn't just be killed because other people vote for you to be killed or that you should be able to be enslaved if the other people in society vote for it. That's so alien to me, but it seemed like the most natural thing in the world to him. Not, of course, not that all Australians think this, but he came from a country, the only country in Western civilization without a, you know, a concrete bill of rights laying that out. So I've got to say, if that doesn't make you think twice about how you think about anything and how your ancestry and traditions and the culture and marketing around you have influenced your thinking on that, then uh, I don't know what to tell you. I think you really got to think twice and it doesn't, doesn't mean that what you're thinking is wrong. It just means that everything is worth scrutinizing to make sure you really believe it and that it's not just being imposed on you from elsewhere or just come to terms with the fact that everything is being imposed from elsewhere and just live your life and be happy. I mean, that's, that's an option, I suppose.